All right, what is going on, Laker fans? Uh, appreciate you guys tuning in. All right, this one is a little – this is one of those where I text Jovan in the morning. What are you doing around 8 o'clock? He's like, let's do it. So uh, appreciate you guys spending some time hanging out here. Of course, Jovan Buha was part of the athletic. And also, by the way, doing his own thing as well. Um, and I'll kind of let him plug what he's doing on YouTube here in just a second. But I appreciate you guys being a part of the show. Um, thank you for hanging out. We're obviously going to talk Lakers basketball and talk about this upcoming series against the Denver Nuggets. Mr. Yovan Buha, what's going on, brother? How are you? I'm doing well, man. This is uh, the best time of the year. Yes. Uh, I'm excited. I've been diving into some Lakers Nuggets film, getting my uh, pre or uh, my preview series, series, <laughs> series preview. Yep. Uh, it's, it's been a long few days in New Orleans. Uh, so, but uh, digging through the, the numbers, the film, and uh, trying to figure out what's going to happen sure. uh, over the next couple of weeks. Yeah, it's interesting. I, I think what, what's so crazy about the position that they're in is, man, we had no idea where this team was going to end up, where they were going to land, who they were going to play. I mean, I know for you, you're kind of in a similar situation. So you're obviously traveling. You're traveling with the team. You're finding out on Sunday. You're staying in New Orleans. So Kind of a kind of a weird couple of weeks, and even leading up to the final day of the regular season, you still had absolutely no idea who the team was going to play. And in your case, what's the next city that you were going to fly to? Yeah, this was one of those trips where I didn't know how long to pack for, so I did pack some extra clothes, and it was like we could be really all five scenarios were in play in terms of uh, the Lakers playing at staying in new orleans uh mm -hmm. going to phoenix going to sacramento uh going to golden state or going home to la and hosting a game uh in the 9 10 matchup so all of these scenarios were still in play uh entering sunday and thankfully the the second easiest one ended up uh playing out which was la just staying in new orleans uh, i had to go to the front desk <laughs> ask for a couple extra nights uh, in my hotel room and uh that was that but uh, outside of returning to LA, which would have been preferable just from a logistical standpoint, uh, obviously not for the Lakers. That, that means they would have lost on Sunday and then been in the 9-10 game. Uh, so it's been a that type of year where, uh, or you know, that time of year rather, where you don't know what's going to happen. And we didn't know if like even two minutes left in the game, uh, the, the, the seven-minute sure. play-in game. Sure. Game's tied. Zion's going off for 40 points. And all of a sudden, you know, he goes out with the injury. And the Lakers make a couple of big, uh, like D'Lo hits that dagger three, AD gets the offensive rebound, seals the game with those two free throws. So it, it was a, a roller coaster couple of days in terms of what's the seating going to be, what's the matchup going to be, are they playing Denver, are they playing OKC, are they playing, you know, so it, it's been a lot, uh, but it's been a lot of fun. Okay, so I actually want to go back to yesterday's game here for a quick second. Just uh, want to tell everybody who's tuning in right now, appreciate you guys hanging out. Please subscribe to the channel if you don't mind. If you got a comment, a question, something that you want to chime in on, feel free to do so in the comments. If you send in the super chat, 100% going to read that. Um, I, I know a lot of people know Jovan because of his work uh, around the Lakers and what he's doing on the athletic. Just a heads up here. Um, Buha's block, which is his – podcast version all episodes with video on spotify apple Podcasts, and on youtube so you can catch him there please subscribe to his channel as well um does a great job obviously covering the team and the nba in general so um you'll want to i'll kind of start off with this and i think this is probably the best way to go here yesterday's game lakers obviously taking on the pelicans um three minutes left to go the pelicans come all the way back um, we end up seeing Zion, uh, you know, obviously at the time we didn't know what the injury was, but he immediately points over to the bench. He's got to check himself out before you saw him have that injury. Three minutes left to go. It's a tie game. Lakers had an 18 point lead. Did you think Lakers were going to win that game? Or did you think the Pelicans? Cause I, I think for me at that point, um, I'm watching that game saying to myself, okay, well, here we go. It looks like they're going to get Sacramento or Golden State. You'll be in a one-game playoff and then potentially play the Oklahoma City Thunder. Did you think yesterday's game just came down to the health of, of Zion? I thought it was a big factor. I still felt the Lakers were going to win the game uh, just because the Pelicans' offense was entirely Zion, and, and yes, it was working 
but I thought at some point, and then, you know, I know Trey Murphy and, and Herb Jones hit some big shots down the stretch, but with the way that Brand, and Brandon Ingram wasn't even on the floor, he basically got benched for most of the fourth quarter. Then you had CJ McCollum go four for 15 uh, with Austin Reeves and Gabe Vincent doing a, a nice job against him. Uh, so I, I felt when it came down to the last couple of minutes, LA was going to be able to get uh, enough stops. Now, uh, again, with the way that Zion, I mean, that was a career night for Zion. Sure. Uh, postseason debut. Uh, is, you know, that was the most points he had in transition in a game. I think he had 14 points uh, in transition, uh, career high, uh, 40 points and 11 rebounds. So like he, he was scoring on AD and LeBron. And I think the, the one thing that did concern me with the way that the game was going was like the Lakers just looked absolutely They're exhausted they look and, ass. and all five starters played 32 or more minutes, uh, for, for D'Lo. LeBron and AD, those guys were logging heavy minutes for the second consecutive game in a span of about three days. AD's dealing with the back spasms. LeBron continues to uh, have to monitor his left ankle and and treat that. So like those guys just didn't look like themselves by the fourth quarter. And I thought you really saw it on the offensive end where uh, all the the actions and the movements and, and all the things that they were doing through the first three quarters just kind of went away and it was very stagnant and trying to iso LeBron, get him with mismatches. And then the Pelicans were doubling and, and trapping and, and turning the Lakers over or forcing like end of shot clock contested jumpers that the Lakers were missing. So, uh, I mean, if maybe if it goes to overtime, I, I definitely would have uh, favored the Pelicans just with how tired the Lakers looked. Uh, but once Zion went out, it, it was clear the Lakers were going to win. Uh, I, I do think like that sealed it for them. The, the Pelicans just didn't have enough offense with the Zion off the floor. Uh, but I, I do think the Lakers, uh, with, with the Delo shot, like the 80 offensive rebound, sure. I still think they find a way to hold on and win the game. Uh, but obviously, I, I think Pelicans would have had a much better chance had Zion not exited when he did. So let, let's kind of, as the dust settles, and before we start talking about the Lakers and the Denver Nuggets, um, we saw a team that played, it was a completely different team from February 1st on, um, had some moments in the last couple of weeks that I don't really think had anything to do with their play. It just had more to do with LeBron's out for a game. AD's out for a game. I mean, the Memphis game, they clearly had no interest in that game. And it, it was just, uh, let's just get through the day. And they, fortunately they did. But before we actually talk about the series coming up against the Nuggets, just what's your takeaway of the team? H how do you feel about how they finished off the regular season how do you feel uh, you have such a great insight when it comes to like, because you're around these guys too, the psyche of the team, the confidence of the team, and we'll get into the nuggets, but just your, your overall thoughts of how they ended up finishing the season. Yeah. Well, the, the Lakers are going to enter game one against the nuggets on Saturday, having won 12 of their last 15 games, mm. which is as basically as hot as you can be. Uh, you referenced February 1st, since February 1st, the Lakers have the fifth best record in the NBA and the fourth best record in the West behind only uh, Denver, Dallas, and Oklahoma City. Hmm. And that's separated by just a matter of losses. Uh, Dallas and OKC have one fewer loss. Denver has two fewer losses. But remember, LA lost a couple games, as you mentioned, because Anthony Davis sure. exited early and then also uh, sat out a game due to headaches and nausea, uh, partly due to uh, getting poked in their hit in the face. Uh, so LA, like really, if you look at those three losses, you can point to those three specific instances of 80 leaving twice early and then not even playing in a game. Uh, LeBron uh, also missed the game. So like the Lakers shows, have basically shows been the playing. value of AD, right? It's I mean, shows the, the value chances, of AD chances of winning a game without Anthony Davis. I mean, it can happen. It's just not going to happen very often. Yeah, and that, that to me was also an added benefit of the Lakers winning the 7-8 matchup is, of course, no team in the West wants to play Denver. I, I think that would be everyone's last pick if we sure. were lining up all the teams on, on a blacktop. Uh, but AD is dealing with this back spasm situation. He was clearly hampered by it against New Orleans. And imagine now if the Lakers had lost that game and we're ramping up to play uh, Friday the on the road on Friday. Or no, Friday and, at home. Mm -hmm. Right at home, but but still, Sabonis obviously plays AD sure. as physical as, as any big in the league. I mean, how many like the, there's been the viral clips of him, you know, trucking him and like like that's a physical matchup for AD. So then to have to go through that and then potentially travel on Saturday and then play an OKC team on Sunday, like 
that would be a, a considerable load for AD to have to handle uh, going into you know a game one situation. So I think LA getting that extra rest and and being able to just prepare and, and get 83 days off before game one like that's really key uh, but la is is playing like their offense has been amazing uh, since january 7th they have the third best offense in the nba again i referenced february 1st like uh they, they've been a top five offense over that span so they, they've really it, it's interesting how the identity of this group flipped throughout the season where they started the season off being a borderline top 10 defense you remember like cam and, and vando and torian oh, yeah. and like that was the identity of this group, and it was let's have uh, you know just a league average ish offense, and even though they were bottom ten for most of that time, and we're gonna win with our defense, and that, that's how they had a lot of success in the in season tournament. Uh, but now they've completely flipped, where one of the best three point shooting teams in the league uh, in terms of percentage, one of the best offensive teams overall with getting to the rim, getting to the free throw line, and, and then creating high percentage uh, open three pointers. So offensively, they are a juggernaut. Uh, defensively is where I still have questions of this group. So uh, I mentioned third offensively since January 7th. They've been 22nd defensively over mm. that span. So it really has flipped where they've gone from being a bottom 10 offense to now a bottom 10 defense. And against the Denver Nuggets, who uh, have the fifth best offensive rating in the league, had the best offense in the playoffs last year. That's my one kind of point of concern entering the series is just like, can LA defend at a high mm. enough level? And granted, they have defended much better over the last 10 games or so. I think they've been around a, a top 10 defense. Now, that has been against some easier competition. That's been like you know, Nets, Grizzlies a couple of times. Like, yep. Yeah, it's, it's been some, some easier teams. So they've not played like a Denver level team. Uh, but, you know, you play the schedule that's ahead of you. And I think the Lakers are entering in a much better spot than they were at this point last year with LeBron being healthier. Uh, th those, I mean, LeBron and AD are, are going to be fresher. There's more breaks in between games. It's not an every other day situation like it was in the conference finals. So, uh, if LA is going to catch Denver, uh, like ideally you just avoid them and, and just go to the finals. But if you're going to play them, this might end up being mm. the best time when LeBron and AD are physically at their best in terms of just freshness and you have some breaks in between the games. So, Yovan, I, I'd be, I want to ask because you said, it's so interesting how a team goes from our identity is defense. And then as the season progresses, their identity becomes offense and they become one of the better offenses in the entire NBA. I think if you'd have told me that the Lakers finished the season, 12 games over 500, if you'd have told me that before the season started, I would have thought, okay, maybe that's a top six, top five team in the Western conference. Clearly not the case this year. So it is what it is, but I'm curious, and, and I know this was kind of made of the conversation. Hypothetically, if the Lakers end up losing to the Denver Nuggets and this is how they go out this year, how much do you think is going to be made about those first 50 games or so? Um, the strategy with the first 50 games. Torian Prince in the starting lineup for as long as he was. I think they're 19-6 and six now since it's Rui Hachimura, Austin Reeves, D'Angelo Russell, LeBron, and Anthony Davis. Yep. Which is a 62-win pace. That's insane. That's insane. So I, I say that because and and three of those losses were the AD injury losses without Anthony so Davis. Let's just say they even go like one and two. Now that's a 63-64 win pace. If they go two and one, like so th they've won at a very high level with this starting lineup. And the only the reason why I bring up that point is part of the reason why the Lakers, yeah, you know, people were saying they wanted to avoid the Denver Nuggets if that was at all possible. Well, one of the ways to avoid the Denver Nuggets in the first round is you go with that starting lineup a lot earlier. I think there were a lot of people, you know, trying to figure out, hey, why are they getting so cute with the starting lineup? I don't know if this is a conversation you've ever had, you know, with the players or with Darvin Ham or anything like that, or maybe this is just your opinion. Why did it take so long? Why did it take so long? And and, and if if you are out in the first round, how much do you think it's fair to look at the way the Lakers started and how much better that their their overall record could have been if maybe they didn't get too cute or they went with that starting lineup that eventually started working i think this is the question of the season depending on how things end up like look maybe the lakers win this series and they they conquer their their denver demons maybe and they, sure. they go on to make the conference finals finals win a championship like wh whatever uh but 
if they don't, then I think you have to look at that stretch. And, and really, I, I go back to the post in season tournament stretch where they went three and 10. And, and that's also why I referenced that January 7th date, because that was that game against the Clippers where they beat the Clippers. They were teetering. Uh, they had lost four in a row. And it, it, you know, at the time, the, the longest losing streak of the season. Uh, that was when I had the report. Uh, with Sean oh, yeah. uh, Sharania of the Athletic about the disconnect in the locker room between the players and the coaching staff and rotations and lineups and guys were frustrated and that was a a, a really a fork in the mode mo uh, you know moment for the Lakers season and they 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 turned it around right like that was uh, from that point on uh, I want to say they're like thirty and and thirteen or thirty and four so, something wow. like that from that point um, so like they they really turned things around from from that stretch on um and uh, again uh, you know uh i want to say uh 22 and 11 or something since since february 1st but like they, they've been just playing at a really high level over the last like two and a half three three and a half months and that was a, a point in the season where they they really uh flip things but i look at february 3rd also as a a you know landmark uh point of the season just because that's when they started Rui Hachimura and went with this starting group and the plan had been as I've reported was to go to uh, back to Jared Vanderbilt because that was the road trip where beginning of oh, the yeah. trip they have the double overtime game against the Warriors and uh, they close with Vando he plays the, the final 19 minutes they finally play the starting lineup that everyone had wanted them to play and they close with it and by the end of the trip, because then remember they had the the back to back losses in Houston, Houston and Atlanta, Atlanta. Mm -hmm. they fall under 500, and they're they're 24 and 25 at that point in the season. And then all of a sudden it's okay. Well, against Boston, we're gonna go back to Vando. Like it's just it's that point in the season. We you know no more getting cute, no more experimenting. Like we need to go with what's worked. Uh, problem is LeBron and AD are late scratches for yep. that game. Uh, Vando starts. Lakers still win the game. Vando plays arguably his best half as a Laker, hmm. but he gets injured at the end of the half. We have not seen him since. So in the next game in New York, uh, they go with Rui as the starter uh, because the Torian starting lineup was just not working. But the fact that it took them, so again, entering the Boston game, they're 24 and 25. It took them until game 50 to realize not good. Torian Prince should not have been the starter. And if I told you entering the season, that this is the starting lineup with Torian uh, and, and the other four guys, and that Torian's going to be the last guy of the the conceivable guys to be benched, to be benched, and that Austin Reeves and D'Angelo Russell are going to be benched before him. You would have laughed me off this show right now, of course. Uh, but of the course. fact that Austin Reeves got benched nine games into the season, D'Lo got benched in December, albeit he was really struggling at that point, mm -hmm. like. Still, I it just there was a there was a couple games there where they had Rui, Austin, and Delo all coming off the bench. So I look at that three and ten stretch post IST as what really did them in because again, uh, it's it's a matter of degrees. Where if the Lakers win, let's say that's even like a six and seven stretch or sure. a seven and six stretch, not even sure. asking for anything like crazy. Three or four more wins that gets you big the four or five with big difference. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, that that's a, a, a completely you know, complete 180 on, on your season or not, whatever. Uh, don't know uh, my, my degrees. Uh, so if we go 360. We're back in the same spot. Okay. So, so we'll say 180. Yeah, um, you're right. 180. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, but <laughs> I think like, so to me, I think that the one kind of indictment on the season has been like, it, it's one thing to experiment and, and that's where mm -hmm. I don't even necessarily hold the, the coaching staff starting Torian against them, but it was clear 20 to, to 30 games into the season that that lineup wasn't working hundred percent that him at the three wasn't working. Mm -hmm. And the fact that their solution was let's bench Austin, let's bench Delo, let's reduce Rui's role. Like th they were basically grasping at all solutions other than just this dude is, is not a, a starting caliber guy on a contending level team why well, and, it, and it's not his fault like that's i, I was just gonna say go, yo, it's yo, not yo, his think, fault. think about this think about all the people that were mad at torian i'm like why are you mad at torian torian's not starting himself and it's kind of funny look at his role today is 20 minutes not feel like a perfect role for torian prince much coming off the bench yeah. and, 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 and he's i think kind he's of been playing better like he the, has the last been. month 
the last he, month has been better than like the previous three months of, of and, Torian play. And, and he's also kind of um, he's found a way to um, change his game up a little bit where he's not just depending on threes or jumpers. He's actually getting a little bit more aggressive, getting to the basket. Anyways, I, I feel like the coaching staff, you either put players in a position to succeed or to fail. And by starting him 50 games and I, I'm OK with let's try this. But I think they had enough data to say, all right, let's move away from it. And I, I don't want to – But the only reason why I was bringing this up is because I think part of the conversation of where the Lakers are today, because they got the Denver Nuggets in the first round, you have to look at those first 50 games and, and say to yourself, okay, well, how'd you dig yourself a hole to where you're basically playing catch-up the entire time? And when you have a starting lineup like they do right now, that's 19-6 and six with three of those losses coming against, uh, you know, obviously games – where Anthony Davis left early, I think that says a lot. So, um, but I, I like what you said. It, it is what it is, right? Like, no, there's nothing you could do at this point, but there is a little bit. If you do end up losing the series, how much are we going to look back on that? So, it's something to uh, to keep in mind there. Um, okay, so let's kind of get to what you said. You've been uh, you've been in the weeds here. You know, once you figured out it was Lakers and the Nuggets, I could. I see you in some type of film room where you lock the door at home. <laughs> no one could come out. Um, it's something I, like that, yeah. I see you on the plane flying back from New Orleans with like a blanket over your head because you got the <laughs> iPad and you're just like – it's almost like a little movie theater that you're creating there. So I, I, I want to just get you know your initial thoughts on the matchup against the Denver Nuggets. And I think there's no um, there's no way to kind of escape this or dodge this. Um, they're great. They, they they really truly are. Nicole Jokic is the best player in the world. Jamal Murray might be the best number two player in in the entire NBA right now, at least complimenting him. But it's in, it doesn't stop there. I mean, we've seen Michael Porter, Aaron Gordon kind of complimenting those guys as well. KCP, every Laker fan knows how great KCP is in his role. Michael Malone's a good coach. They're role players of Christian Brown, I'll use as an example. Um when we walk into this series, just give me your thoughts of how you feel initially about this matchup against the Nuggets. So I think you can make a case that, um, you know, I, I was asked, I just did a mailbag and I was asked, where would you rank the Lakers among the playoff teams? And I didn't do a, a team by team ranking. I, I more tiered it out. Uh, but my tier one was Boston and Denver. And my tier two, the Lakers were among a, a few uh, all West teams. I'm, I'm, I'm out on the East. I, I, I think Boston's going to walk to the finals, hmm. uh, barring like an injury. And I, I just Knicks, Bucks, Cavs. Like I just everybody Sixers, has holes. Heat, I just I, everybody I, has I, holes. Yep, everyone has major holes. I, I think Boston's going to walk to the finals. But uh, you know, East that, that aside, uh, like it was several West teams for me in like that tier two with the Lakers in there. And I think you could argue the Lakers maybe are the third best team in the league right now. Like it, it's hmm. they're in that conversation. Uh, Dallas is playing really well. Phoenix is playing really well. Obviously OKC and Minnesota have the seating, uh, but the Lakers are in that conversation for like arguably the third best team in the league uh, at this very moment. The problem is Denver <laughs> is arguably the best or the second best team. Sure, like Boston sure. has had some historic numbers, though. I think some of that has been uh, juiced up a little bit with the, the, the pace and the scoring and, and the competition hmm. in the East and how bad some of those teams are. Uh, so I don't, I do not think these Celtics are on the level of the 2017 Warriors, 96 Bulls. Like mm. they're putting up some numbers on par with those teams, but I, I'm not, I'm not quite there yet. If, if they go like 16 and one and win the championship, okay, maybe different you know, conversation. conversation, but yeah. Denver is to me um, like that five man unit. Uh, one underrated element of it is they've been basically fully healthy over the last couple of, uh, of seasons, like KCP missed some games this year. Uh, Jamal Murray did end up yep. missing, I think 25, 26 games, but like they played last year more minutes than any lineup. Mm. And in the regular season this year, they uh, that's including the postseason. So, but they, they were third in the regular season and then adding in the postseason more minutes than anybody this year, more minutes than anybody in the regular season. So like from a continuity standpoint, that unit, like not only, are there a lot of talented players? Like I would say KCP is probably the fifth guy. And as Laker fans can attest to, like he was at times the the third best player uh, for the Lakers in that 2020 run. Sure. Um, and, and like adding in, you know, MPJ and, and Gordon, like there's a lot of talent there. 
but all those guys complement each other so well on both ends of the floor. Uh, and, and, uh, I just think that that is a, a two way juggernaut that there really is no hole in the lineup. Like I think MPJ has gotten much better as a defender. He's not a lockdown guy by any means, but he at least knows how to use his length. Uh, and and athleticism a little bit more than in in prior years. Uh, Aaron Gordon, I think, defends LeBron as well as mm. just about anybody. Uh, Jokic is actually held up fairly well against AD. Like he'll still get his, but Jokic makes it tough on him. Uh, you know, Murray is six five, so like he's he's not a great defender either, but he's at least he's got the size and, sure. and he's he's got a bigger frame. So like defensively, they're sound. Offensively, we already know like the Jokic Murray two man game. Uh, it, it is the statistically, you know, it's up there with the the most lethal duos in terms of like points per possession. Then you got KCP, MPJ running around, hitting threes, Gordon's crashing, getting the those lob passes from Jokic. Mm-hmm. So like, they're just a really tough team to guard. And the one thing that LeBron said last night, because uh, my question post game to everyone was like, "What are your early thoughts on Denver?" Yep. I know you guys are gonna dig into the film, but like. Just, you know, when you hear your matchup with Denver, like what's the first thing that comes to mind? And LeBron said, we have to play mistake-free basketball. And that is the the uh, consistent theme I have seen on the film with the Lakers versus the Nuggets is the Nuggets are experts at you make a mistake, like you turn the ball over, they take they're take they getting out in transition and they're scoring. Or you uh, miscommunicate on a switch off the ball there that guy's cutting to the basket for a dunk or a layup mm. uh you know and you, you misread a coverage or you, you help off a shooter too much like they're fighting that guy and he's drilling a three so like the lakers have to be as focused and as locked in as they've been all season to win this series and i do look at that that uh the regular season finale game against the pelicans like that to me was as close to perfect two-way basketball as the Lakers have played. Like I went back and rewatched that game and I was taking notes and I was like, I don't really have a lot of notes to take. Like Mm. they're moving the ball well offensively. They're they're running stuff. Defense Uh, was everywhere. Defense was everywhere. LeBron Mm -hmm. was locked in. He had five steals, uh, 80s protecting the paint. D'Lo's trying. Austin's locking up CJ McCall. Like they were just very engaged Mm. and and you got contributions from, from guys off the bench and like, that was a perfect example to me of like, if the Lakers can replicate that against Denver, I think this is a, a close series. If they are doing what they did in the previous matchups, where again, it's just little mistakes add up to Denver uh, crushing them in, in crunch time. So like, I guess my, my, my thoughts going in are LeBron, I, I think is much healthier than last season. He's also mm-hmm. shooting almost 15% better on threes. Uh, than he was last year at this point uh, entering the series. So LeBron making his threes and getting to the rim more, like I think we're going to see a different version of LeBron that is going to, Denver's really going to struggle to contain. Uh, Then I think overall the Lakers are better. Their offense is better. The starting lineup is better. Uh, So I think the Lakers have a much better chance of winning or at least making this a competitive series than they did last year. I think it's just going to come down to Darvin needs to push the right buttons with the rotations and the lineups. Uh, if a guy's struggling, he's out. Like, there's no like, you know, Torian Prince is 0 for three on threes, and you're keeping him in there, or or he's getting, you know, backdoored or whatever. And, and Torian's just one example, but like Gabe, Spencer, Jackson, whoever. Sure. You need a a tight leash with the rotation, and it really needs to be like starters are 35 plus minutes a night, mm-hmm. and LeBron and AD are 42 plus minutes a night. Like, you, you have breaks in between games, uh, so I think you play the right guys. You you are very locked into the game plan. And you have the requisite focus and energy, like those get you at least in a close game with them. And then, as LeBron also said in his answer, then it comes down to the final few possessions and it just comes down to who out executes. And Denver has constantly won that battle. Sure. But I think at some point, Lakers are going to have to win a crunch time game against these guys. And all it takes is one. Like they go in and steal game one. Now, all of a sudden, you have the confidence, you have the momentum. And I think it's a different series, but you lose game one. Now you've lost nine in a row. Uh, now Denver has all the confidence mm. and going into to game two. And like, so I, I really think the Lakers trying to steal game one is, is going to be paramount for any shot of winning this series. Uh, just because I, I think on some level, there's a psychological element here where Denver continues to beat them in the same way. It's kind of like Charlie Brown in the football. And if, if the Lakers can't break through in game one or game two, 
I, I just I, I don't see how they win the series. You know, it's interesting. You, you said a couple things there, and I, I think if we go back to last year's playoffs, um, you're right, LeBron. There are definitely times he didn't look 100 percent healthy, even though he was doing everything he can to make it happen. Uh, D'Angelo Russell was literally as non-factor of a player as you could possibly yeah. me, be. Um, Jamal Murray was – I remember I, I keep – MJ. <laughs> I keep – I okay, here's the funny thing. I keep going back to game two in Denver. And I was at that game, was doing pre and post from the arena. And, okay, Lakers lose game one. And they knew how critical game two was going to be. And they come out, if you remember, they got like a 10, 11 point lead. Felt like they have control of the game to an extent. Jamal yeah. Murray goes for, I want to say 23 in the fourth quarter, yeah. completely takes over the game. Jokic is hitting these unbelievable shots on Anthony Davis. Jamal Murray is doing, yeah, listen, I, and, and it wasn't even one of those, you just, you almost had to just kind of, hey, this is, I don't know what else they can do against Denver. In a game like this on the road, and the Nuggets, once I felt like the Lakers were down 0-2, and I think this is what's so critical in these first two games. And maybe you're right. Maybe it is the first game. But if you walk back to crypto and it's 0-2, I don't think you're winning that series. And I don't care. It doesn't really – Now you've lost it. 10 in a row to them. you lost 10 in a row. Point, and, 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 I, and I don't even think home court even matters at that point. I just think you know that that's – a team that's continuing to build momentum. I love what you said about the psyche of it as well. I almost, I, it's tough for me to even say, I was doing this yesterday as, as, just with some of the radio stuff that I was doing, but I, I, I was talking about how I don't even care about getting to four wins. Can you be one and one after two games? Can you be two and two after four games? And I, I think that's the only way they can look at this because it is such an obstacle and it feels like it's such a mountain to climb that you almost just got to cut this up into small little pieces to, can you at some point give Denver a little bit of doubt of, wait a minute here, we actually have a series and, and, you know, obviously whatever happens from here, we'll have to see. But um, I agree that the psyche part of it, the, the fact that you've lost X amount of games in a row, I think early on, I think the series is going to come down to those first two games. I really do. Yeah. Um I I mean that that's that's it. And now I will say that the one thing that is interesting with this matchup too is I we haven't really seen these two teams in their current forms play each other. Right. Because that March second matchup, uh there was no KCP on the Denver side mm -hmm. and there was no Gabe Vincent on the Lakers side and mm -hmm. Spencer Dinwiddie hadn't fully acclimated yet. That was still early in his Lakers tenure and he was still kind of finding his, his way. Um, like I think Spencer has been much better over the last five, six weeks uh, since that game. And the Lakers hadn't fully, like they were close on the rotation, but I, I don't think they had fully gotten there uh, that the starting group has still had, you know, another six weeks from that point. So That's a good point. I think the start, the starting group has a, a level of continuity that they did not have entering that March 2nd game, uh, Denver will have KCP. And I think the Lakers just rotation overall with having Spencer, Gabe, Torian, and, and Jackson as like the, the nine man unit. Uh, like, remember that was the game where cam was closing, which mm. did not make any sense. Uh, he was not defending, uh, Jamal at, at a, a, you know, like he was not stopping Jamal and offensively they were putting Jamal on him and just ignoring him. And mm. I think he missed an open three and, and might've had a turnover uh or near turnover uh like late in that game so like don't close the cam reddish and uh like i think so i think the lakers and are gabe, and gabe was spot. good and gabe was good yesterday gabe, you, you, gabe, yeah like gabe you can tell he's that getting second quarter gabe mm -hmm. was uh a game changer and that player like remember gabe was the dennis replacement like gabe mm -hmm. was the primary addition of the offseason lakers did not have that guy basically all year and if he can come in and disrupt Jamal Murray or even Reggie Jackson in like the, the bench minutes and win those minutes or, or at least hold steady, you know, just it's hold huge. down the fort it's huge. and hit open threes. Yeah. Like that's all he has to do. He just has to hit open threes and play good defense. And he does those two things. Like the Lakers are getting solid production for 14, 18 minutes a night off the bench uh, from backup point guard. And like, that's all Gabe has to do. And, you know, I, I think this is kind of a perfect transition here because the other guard for the Lakers, um, 
and I mentioned it a quick second earlier where I was talking about how D'Angelo Russell last series, you know, it, it was it was D'Lo cost himself a lot of money probably last series against the Denver Nuggets. He's not, clearly been a different player this year, and or at least over these last three months or so. Um, the big shot yesterday against the Pelicans – is what it is. Him chirping with Jose Alvarado. He's clearly, I, I think it's safe to say when D'Angelo Russell plays good basketball, the chances of the Lakers winning that game increases. It feels like increases by a lot. Um, is his performance in this upcoming series, you think, the most critical? Is that what you're going to watch? Is that what you're going to pay attention to most? Do you feel like if D'Lo has a good series or if D'Lo has a couple good games that's the best chance for the Lakers to potentially hang with Denver in the, in the series. Yeah. I think we've seen this season that D'Lo is still a bit of a wild card for the Lakers. I think more often, like he's probably having seven or eight out of 10 good games. He'll still have uh, the, the stinker or two. Uh, but for the most part, he's been very consistent. He's been the Lakers third best player, at least third best offensive player for large stretches of the season. Uh, he's become more of the third option. I think Austin has taken a back step offensively and taken on more of a defensive role, guarding the CJ McCollum's, the De'Aaron Foxes, the the SGAs, uh, et cetera. And I think they've kind of figured out how to make that partnership work uh, on, on both ends of the floor. Uh, but to me, the, the question, and this gets into some of the crunch time stuff of like, who are the five guys you close with? Because if we go back to last uh, Western Conference Finals, in my opinion, LeBron, AD, Austin, and Rui were the four best players for LA in that series. Fifth best was probably Dennis, and that's why they ultimately started that sure. lineup uh, to to end the series, and uh, that that was often the closing lineup in that series. Uh, but those four, like, I mean, LeBron and AD or LeBron and AD, that, that goes without saying. But Austin, I, I thought, really stepped up in that series and, and was one of the few Lakers that did not look afraid of the moment. I think that has translated into the matchups this season where e even if um, you know he's not making shots, he's still defending at a high level or, or you know trying his hardest on the defensive end. And Austin is just a, a gamer. He he finds what you know, loose balls, rebounds, like whatever. Austin's gonna find a way to contribute. So I think Austin's in there. And then I think Rui's in there, where Rui obviously has is fit well next to LeBron and AD. He's been shooting 40 plus percent on threes. He's been rebounding the ball better. And I think he's been trying defensively and, and the Lakers have been putting him on uh, tougher defensive assignments. So those four guys, I think, are the closing locks. The question is, who's the fifth guy? And is it D'Lo? Like it should be D'Lo, right? In theory, it's D'Lo. But if the Nuggets are targeting him and he's not making shots, and all of I a sudden, be he starts to second Gabe guess. Is in or Dinwiddie, sure, sure. Dinwiddie or or Torian, mm -hmm. uh, maybe Jackson, and you go a bigger lineup. Like ideally, it's Vando, right? Vando would be great to just go with a bigger lineup, have Vando in there. But how the Lakers defend Denver in crunch time and how D'Lo fits into all of that is going to be interesting to me. Mm -hmm. uh, but I, I think to your point, like he needs to make shots, and it doesn't. Maybe he doesn't need to play at the level he's played at all season. Maybe that's unrealistic. Like they'll probably put KCP on him. And KCP is a guy who's sure. going to get all defense uh, consideration. Uh, I already have talked to some voters who are voting for KCP on one of the two all defense teams. So like KCP is in a really good to elite defensive player. And I would not be surprised. It, like he fits the profile of the type of guy who can disrupt D'Lo, a, a bigger, uh, more athletic, like strong physical wing. Uh, but all D'Lo really has to do is hit his open threes when those opportunities are there, uh, you know, help move the ball and, and play and make offensively. And then just really just tread water defensively. Like doesn't have to be a stopper, but like play within the scheme. Don't make mistakes, uh, box out. And like he does those things at a minimum. I think he, he's playable and he could be a useful player. But once it starts to be Denver's targeting him defensively, the, like because Denver really like it was a psychological element too of, Denver from game one was we're targeting D'Lo. We're trying to take him out of the series. And then they were trash talking him in the media. Like Mike Malone went at him. Bruce Brown went at him. They all, they were saying like, you know, that's the guy we're trying to go at defensively. Yep. We're, we're trying to bring it like, we, you know, we know defense isn't his strong suit. We're trying to bring him into the action. So like there was an all out assault from Denver, uh, both on the court and off the court 
to try and get in Delo's head, try to disrupt him. And it worked. Sure. And this is really the, the kind of a, the money moment for Delo of like, um, you know, but there's an alternate universe where the Lakers are on a, the opposite end of the bracket. Maybe they make the conference finals and like, he's had a couple good series and now it's like, okay, like build off that. But this is going to be the lasting image it, or, or, you know, memory for, uh, the Lakers and for rival teams, if he doesn't have a good playoff series for the second consecutive year against Denver. So that to me, like not to spoil too much of my preview, uh, but my Lakers player uh, X factor is Delo, and just mm -hmm. how you know can he be better than six points on 32% shooting? It's a very low bar, but if he can do that, and I think he can, that's what makes this a more competitive series. Well, and I think you said it best. I, I think Denver, hundred percent agrees with us that he's such an important player of course kcp is going to be on him right like wouldn't you do the same thing and i, yeah. I think there is going to be this can we disrupt d'angelo russell and if they did it last year and this is up to d'angelo russell and this is going to be part of kind of his development his growth i mean i don't mind if d'lo takes it personal but just play basketball You've been doing this for the last three months. I mean, I I, I do like a chippy D'Lo. I, I think there are times where that can be used to his advantage. Um, but at the same time, I, I agree and, I, and expect Denver to do everything they can to get him off of his game because he is that important. I mean, he adds an element that when he's going, all of a sudden just the game looks so much easier for LeBron, for Anthony Davis, for Austin Reeves, for Rui, for everybody. So I think um, – what happens with D'Lo obviously is going to be a, a big, big piece. You mentioned just real quick here on this one, you mentioned Vando there for a quick second. Do you expect anything from Vanderbilt? Do you expect uh, you heard anything or this is not a series where you feel like you can expect anything from him? I, I honestly don't know. Uh, and I was asked that in the, the mailbag that I, I referenced earlier. And you hear different things. Like I was here in a couple months ago, he's done for the season. And then I reported that. Then I had people from the team push back like, oh, no, no, he's he's doing well. He's going to be back before the season ends. Obviously, that did not happen. Sure. Uh, then later in the season, I was hearing, you know, targeting last couple of weeks of the regular season. That did not happen. So uh, I've grown we a little skeptical. A, we we're supposed to get an update, too, like a week ago. We were or supposed so. to get an update. Uh, yep. So th that uh, end of the week, uh, Darvin Ham says early next week, we're going to get a reevaluation update. Uh, no one asked about it. So like mid ne that next week, or it was, it might've even been the end of the week, still no update. I ask, Hey, Darvin is, you know, you said there was going to be a reevaluation. Is there any update on Vando? And he just says, he said, get he out. had a good workout. Get out of here. <laughs> he, he says, no, you know, uh, no update. Uh, everything's the same. Uh, yep. he had, he had a good workout, uh, today. And like, that was it. Mm. So I've heard he's, he started to ramp up his conditioning, which is a step in the right direction. Uh, like he was doing some light jogging. I, I believe that's started to ramp up to, um, you know, more intense cardio work. Uh, but really the, the next big step is getting back on the court and actually doing scrimmaging and contact work. And to my knowledge, he is not at that point yet. Uh, we will, the Lakers will practice tomorrow. We'll, we'll I'm sure that will come up with Darvin. Uh, if someone else doesn't ask it, I'm going to ask it, uh, just because it is a big component for a potential win in this series like the lakers don't have another guy who can do what vando can do he might be the only guy on this roster that can really disrupt mpj on the perimeter uh, like I, I think people look at him as a jamal defender but i almost look at him more as an mpj defender of, mm. of navigating screens and, and cuts and, and just making sure mpj isn't like lakers always lose track of mpj for some reason. michael porter they're, jr they're helping off of him he's a killer to the just, lakers so, so he's shooting 43% on catch and shoot threes this season, which is an elite mark, like, you know, very high level stuff against the Lakers, 88%, against Lakers, 61%, <laughs> which is just absurd. And last game, last time they played each other, he made 10 to 10, 10 shots. 10 to 10. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. So Lakers got like, they got to keep track of that guy. And a lot yeah. of it is like, he's a high level shot maker to be clear, but a lot of it is like Lakers helping off of him for no reason, helping off of him a pass away. In transition, they're not tracking him. He just walks into open threes. So, like, Lakers cut out some of that stuff. That's a way to keep the game more competitive in the pre-crunch time parts. Uh, but Vando, so I guess I had heard potentially first round, like maybe mid to late first round. But I, again, with with the conflicting reports and, and, and intel that I've heard, I, I'm not counting on it. But it obviously would be a... a 
welcome a surprise much needed exactly mm -hmm. it would be a much needed boost to the defense particularly um if he, they could get him back so uh he's not been ruled out for the season he's not had season ending surgery so that is all uh like there are some positive signs in terms of him continuing to ramp up more sure and not sure. being ruled out yet so i, I would say that the longer the lakers like they can win this series uh, second round like that increases the odds obviously but uh i i don't have like a target game three game five like i think we'll just have to see and, and maybe get an update tomorrow though i probably doubt it <laughs> yeah no i'm with you on that it, and it, that hasn't been the case so that's been the only consistent it's really been the, the, the case with them all year with the injuries um okay i, I want to read a couple comments here so if you're out i know we got a lot of comments here we'll get to a few of them here um one here, appreciate the super coast. This game one is crucial if we want to have a decent chance. Agree, Jovan, you were talking about that a little bit earlier. Kostas is in Greece and is also inviting you because he's invited me forever in Greece to hang out with Kostas. So, Kostas, I appreciate that. We appreciate okay. that very much. Yeah, okay? I appreciate well, it. I'll, we, I'll hit you up if I'm ever out there. We know this, Jovan. Laker fans are everywhere. So I do this they thing. Are. I do this thing on on uh, the channel where I do th some called roll call. So people will just put where they're tuning in from. And you That's know awesome. this, Laker fans are everywhere. They're everywhere. Yeah, I mean, I, so I, I've Greece, seen my, my YouTube Greece metrics show their Philippines, everywhere. India, like uh, everywhere. Yeah, they're everywhere. Um, but the, the one thing, and I'll, I'll let you kind of answer this. It, it sounds like you put when the stock was in there earlier that game one to you sounds like the most important game to you. That that sounds it, it, is that is that how you feel that if you're going to catch the nuggets off guard or if you're going to still get tell me why you think game one is the is the most critical of them yeah i mean obviously like if you go down 2-0 and you win the next two and it's 2-2 like or or you win game two obviously a, a, an even series is an even series but i think there's a psychological element to it of just the frustration that the lakers have had especially the last couple of losses uh because i think the last couple like opening night Denver had a, a big lead for stretches of that game. But the last two losses, like uh, one was the, the Kobe statue night, and that was a close game. And then Denver did what they did in crunch time and, and put the game away. And then the last game, you, you, it was kind of similar to game two where you know, Jamal didn't go off for 23 uh, in the fourth quarter, but Lakers had a, a double-digit lead at one point in that game. And everything was clicking. The offense was looking really good. Starters are playing well. And then once again, they collapse in the final four or five minutes of that game, and Denver just crushes them and ends up it winning that game so quick by too. double digits. It's just an avalanche. Like mm -hmm. it's appropriate with the with the Denver, uh, you know, reference. But like, it they just hit the Lakers with an avalanche every crunch time. And uh, like this year, they've outscored LA. They, they played seven crunch time minutes. They've outscored them twenty seven to ten. And like that's all, and that's not even including because crunch time is only uh, or clutch time, crunch time, basically the same thing. But like five, within five points in the final five minutes. So if you're, you know, if it's within four, and then Denver hits a three, and now it's seven, crunch time is technically over. So they're not counting those. But so like if we actually looked at like what are the margins in these games in the final five minutes, like Denver is like stomping the league. Probably crazy. Sort. This happens crazy sort. every single game. Yeah. So LA, I, I just think. In like Tori and Prince, um, uh, about three weeks ago, we're in Memphis for for the first Memphis matchup uh, of the two that they just recently had, and uh, he had a quote uh, about like you know, are, do you feel like you guys are peaking at the right time, like the confidence, all that stuff? And he's like, yeah, like right now, no one wants to see us except for a couple teams. And then he confirmed after the interview that the two teams he was referencing or Denver and Sacramento. Mm. And you rarely hear a player, like it's typically the bravado of no one wants to see us. Like, you know, we'll, we'll beat anybody. But like, there was kind of an acknowledgement of there are a couple of teams that wouldn't mind seeing us. And those are Denver and Sacramento because they've had our number for sure. the last couple of years. And I, I think, so I, I guess game one to me, like just as a road team, I, like looking at last year and the way that the Lakers won in Memphis and won in Golden State, it was setting the tone for the series, taking game one, and they didn't have to win another road game because they already got like all, all you need as the underdog is one road game, hmm. and you get that, and you, you're set up for the rest of the series. You don't have to win on the road the rest of the way. You can just win your home games, and you also just set a tone and, and, and gain an edge in the series. And I think for LA, with the psychological edge that, and, and remember, like 
going back to the summer, the, the Nuggets are trash talking the Lakers. Sure. And Mike Malone and the the Who's Your Daddy and, and this and that. And it's like the and then the Lakers, like Anthony Davis at opening uh media day talking about, oh, me and Braun had conversations about uh the Nuggets and like you know, we can't wait to see them and da da da. And guess what? It's basically been a, it, it's been a seven game sweep, right? Like it, it's continued this season. So, uh, and that's the thing. Like I've seen Laker fans saying, well, they're not going to hit the same ridiculous shots that they did in the conference finals. I'm like, they've been hitting those shots against the Lakers all regular season. Like go back and look. Jokic was hitting moon balls in LA. Uh, MPJ went 10 for 10. Like mm. that was maybe the most ridiculous shooting performance a Nugget has had against the Lakers. So like, this is what the Nuggets do. They turn into uh, like the the Splash Brothers with all five guys <laughs> against the sure, Lakers. Sure. It just kind of happens that way. Um, so I think the Lakers, if they can come out, take game one, that will you, you slay the dragon. You you get that off your back in get terms some of like momentum because you lose game one. Now all of a sudden it's well, why didn't story. you why didn't you duck these guys? Mm -hmm. And Denver's now won nine in a row and like the, just the weight of game two. Because to your point, you don't want to go back to LA down 2-0. Like that, that's probably a wrap at that point. It probably is a five game series. So you're not winning really, four or five. You, mm -hmm. you need to win at least one of the first two, but I think game one is slightly more important because I think your odds of losing game two are, are higher if you don't win game one, just from like a mental uh, edge perspective. Like I, I think you, you need to, it, it's kind of like when you're, if you're fighting a bully, like you, you need to, you need to get a punch in, right? Like the Lakers need to get a, a haymaker in and send a message to Denver. Like this isn't last year. And if Denver goes up one zero two zero, I think at that point it's just the 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 confidence that they're going to have and, and the mental edge they're going to have is just uh, too much to overcome. Tommy Alvarado, zero uh, and eight versus Denver in the last eight games. Lakers due for a win. It might be just as easy as that. You know, sometimes you're just due for a win. Yeah. Sometimes Jovan. Hopefully, uh, hopefully that's the case. A couple others here. Uh, yeah, can't stand MPG or MPJ. Um, I think the reason why is because the man, I feel like, never misses a shot against the Lakers. Um, avoid the continuous threes from Denver. So we got a lot of Laker fans that, you know, obviously have a, a lot of different thoughts when it comes to the Nuggets. But I, ultimately, for me, I, I try to take the emotion out of it. They just been they've been the class of the NBA. So if, if you're gonna have a chance against the Denver Nuggets, and you'll, I'm talking about, just have a chance. I'm not even saying go win four games. If we're gonna make, if they're gonna make it a series, place basically got to play flawless basketball. And I know that's not realistic, but um, if you have a bad quarter, that could cost you the game against Denver. If you have a bad six minutes, that can cost you the game against Denver. There's certain things maybe you're able to get away with with some of these other teams that obviously they're not going to be able to uh, to get away with. Um, okay. Our plan was to go around 30 to 40 minutes. We're way over time. Guys, Jovan's got to get the hell out of here. <laughs> He's got to go get some sleep. Guy's got to catch some shut eye here. Um, Jovan, do me a favor. I, I know you got a lot of stuff going on. And and recently here in the last couple of months, you obviously started Buha's Block, your podcast. Um, please plug everything. I know these are a lot of Laker fans that can also catch coverage on your channel. So please, if you don't mind, plug wh where they can catch you. Yeah, so uh, well, I appreciate that. And, and first of all, you can read my work at The Athletic. That's where all my writing is at. Uh, but on the audio and video front, I recently started a YouTube channel a couple months ago and, and launched my video podcast, Buha's Block. Uh, started doing, tried experimenting with a post-game reaction and it got a good reaction. And uh, people were asking for, why don't you do this every game? So started doing that. So I'll be doing a couple episodes a week and then doing a reaction uh, post game to each game that the Lakers play. Uh, so if you have not checked out my channel, just at Yovan Buha uh, on YouTube. And then you could also uh, find the podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, uh, your podcast platform of choice, just searching Buha's Block or Yovan Buha. I'm going to put it on, on the details below as well. So um, we Appreciate obviously it. got uh, we got a fun series coming up, challenging series coming up. The Western Conference is just so good so that's going to be obviously incredible I, I love what you said about you're not even looking at the east i'm kind of with you i mean i watched both of those games yesterday obviously i had reason to but i i, I i'm gonna have to catch up i know philly won i don't even know who's winning in the uh in the bulls and uh the the bulls Hawks were killing game. them last okay. last i had checked yeah so it'll be bulls miami i saw jimmy butler he's gonna looks like he's gonna miss some time so 
Unfortunately, I saw that as well. Um, okay, we will uh, let's do this again down the road, Jovan. I appreciate you uh, taking the time and hanging out for everybody. We had over 400 hanging out live, so I appreciate you guys doing as, uh, doing that as well. Please subscribe to the channel. I'll be back probably before the Laker game on Saturday. We'll put up some more content. So thank you for hanging out, uh, Laker fans. Appreciate it, and I uh, hope you guys have a good rest of your day.